Okay, thank you very much, Senator. So to start with, uh, farming is as much about people as it is about product. Um, so I guess I'd like to kick off the discussion today with our panel by talking about the changing face of agricultural fisheries and forestry communities in Australia. And I'd like to start with you, Neil, if I could, because you've seen firsthand how dramatically uh, a rural community can change from your, your childhood to now, and also your research looking, I mean, we couldn't have forecast 20 years ago that we would be here. So I'm wondering where you see us particularly, or where do you see rural communities being in 20 years? How are those communities going to change? To Oh, they're on there now. I'm, I'm going to somewhat Welsh on that. I'm just, I've just made a list here of about 15 changes, big changes that have happened since my career started, and I predicted none of them. Not in the formal sense, but I saw none of them coming. So whatever I say now, you can all take with a grain of salt, because I think if, if, if I had stood up in front of a group like this and said, these are the changes that will happen and it will have this impact on farm communities, I would have been howled out of the room, possibly, or laughed out. And I certainly wouldn't have believed myself anyway. And so I, I, I suppose my number one thought is that we're going to have a lot of trouble making predictions about many of the shocks that are going to hit us. The only thing we can be sure of is that they will, something will happen. And so we've got to be able to adapt to it. But I, if I was going to pick one or two trends that aren't going to change, I think one is in the more empty areas of agriculture, and I say empty as in large farms, landscapes with fewer and fewer people in them, I can't see that trend changing. Um, and in fact, I could potentially see it accelerating. And, and I think that's going to drive a lot of social changes in farm households. Um, one that interests me is I'm detecting a trend towards absentee farming. I mean, absentee in the sense of if you're going to get a partner who's interested in sharing a life with you, you make that choice. Is that on the farm or is it in the nearby town that offers the services that a modern family and a modern wife in particular expects? And that means the next generation of farmers' children, a lot more and more of them will not be growing up on the farm. And is that going to change the attitude to farming as a potential future? Is it going to be seen more like another job or profession rather than a calling. Because I'd say most of the people of my age that went into farming went into it as a family calling. And that's not a normal occupational decision. Yeah. Catherine, perhaps if I could ask you, I mean, you talked about the romance, you know, that, that there's, there's a real narrative, a cultural narrative associated with farming. There's always been this a romance associated with it. But you, you feel that there's maybe a shift away from that kind of romantic notion of farming and the kind of a, towards a more hard-headed, pragmatic, business-like approach to farming? Yeah, I think, um, you know, farming still is a fantastic lifestyle, but, you know, everybody here in this room, you're all here because you're very progressive, dynamic, intelligent people. And I think what we've got to recognise is that farming has gone from being a lifestyle where your father handed you down the farm, exactly as Neil said, to actually being very, very switched on business people. We can't keep managing our farms the way that we've always done it and expect it to, main to remain viable. We're, we're living in a very dynamic and rapidly changing social, economic, political landscape. So with that, I mean, we've got the Nuffield Scholars in the room. I mean, they're a phenomenal example of you know, where I think farming needs to head. We need to, we need to really start taking responsibility and treating farming as a business, because mm. fundamentally that's where we're at. Tanya, I mean, you obviously, Banks, you'd be looking very far in the future. What's your perspective on this? Um, look, I, I strongly agree. I think the reality for agriculture to thrive and to continue, you know, um, as a successful industry or, you know, by subsector in Australia, we actually more and more need to improve our financial governance or management information around how we run our businesses. I think the level of complexity in farming businesses has continued to grow over the last you know, 10, 15, 20 years. You know, understanding how to market and brand and package your product uh, is incredibly important in terms of being able to understand then what markets, whether domestic or internationally, you want to play in and where in that supply chain, you know, your role is, um, is actually also going to define who's, you know, more or less successful because capital investment is absolutely imperative for 
success, you know, to be associated with agriculture. And that investment is going to take many shapes and forms, whether that's, you know, foreign investors, domestic, you know, at the farm gate, in the processes, and the better clarity you have about how your business performs, you know, put aside cyclical or seasonal issues, the better you're going to be able to attract an, an investor to want to put their money into your business. Are you seeing, from a banking perspective, are you seeing a change in the kind of people who are going into, I guess, primary industry businesses at this stage? I mean, are you starting to see changes and trends of the kind of people? I mean, you sort of talked about, it used to be that the family farm handed down, but maybe now it's shifting to, to larger scale operations. I'm wondering if that's sort of coming out at all in the people who are coming in? We're definitely seeing a, a range of people. So we definitely are seeing a more, some more corporatised farming coming in, but also in terms of understanding the wanting to shore up supply or within the processing side. And definitely there are examples where it's equity rather than, or as a, a minority shareholding versus those who want to operate the farm. But the reality is, you know, the stats are, I think by 2050 it could be as close to only 10% of intergenerational change actually happening for farming. So being able to better prepare for that, and you know, I think the same point Neil makes, that's a prediction. So it could be actually a, a much bigger number that remains in the farm, but I think over the next 10, 15, 20 years, depending on how those businesses operate, and the lifestyle choices that that can create, and frankly, how technology plays into the remoteness of how remote you really are is going to play into you know, what that looks like. Yeah. Senator Kovic, I mean, you've had a long involvement with this portfolio. I'm wondering what changes you've seen in terms of the, the I guess, rural communities, agricultural communities, and, and that shift, that demographic shift that, that um, Neil and Tanya and Catherine are looking at. Look, not only in the portfolio, but when I escaped our dairy farm too many years ago to remember now, uh, uh, you, you look back at the changes in the rural communities that we lived in um, and still exist now. The, the, the valley where we were milking cows was settled in the late 1890s. By the 30s, there were about 15 or 16 families there. By the 1970s, there were four, and I think there's two left in that community now. So the point that was made about ch change occurring is certainly something that's going to continue. Um, and the thing that I've seen, I suppose, is the onset of technology, the importance of research and development, um, the application, the extension of that research in particular, um, and ensuring that, um, that farmers understand that and have the opportunity to take it up. I, su I think I saw about 18 months, perhaps two years ago, large... Um, finance organisations and accounting firms starting to take a real interest in the agricultural sector. Uh, and that's starting to now be demonstrated by the, the way that that's changing. Uh, and the real um, sense of requirement to run it as a business, yes, it's a lifestyle, and I think it'll always, always remain that to a certain extent. But you have to be prepared to make really cold, hard decisions. And I reflect on a comment made by a chap by the name of Tim Reid, um, who's a cherry grower in Tasmania and happens to be Australia's Farmer of the Year at the moment. And he was given a piece of advice when he was young, which was don't get attached to the asset. Now that's something that I think a lot of farmers actually do, but he now credits that advice with his, his success, where he's changed his business model completely from being an apple grower in the Huon to being one of the largest cherry exporters, uh, the first to export into China and uh, opening up new markets and moving his business up into the Derwent Valley into a different place. And, and, and that one piece of advice being an important part of his consideration. So um, there's a whole range of things. Education is going to play an enormous role. I think the changing demographic that we're seeing in the farming sector is going to be really important. There's an enormous amount of work to do there. Um, the application of science in of farming. So you know, I think those trends will all continue. Um, the balance between corporate and family farming, I think we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see. Yeah. There will always be a cohort of family farmers, I'm sure, but where the balance lies, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So you sort of hinted as well about sort of changes and, and improving in sustainability, which I guess leads on to my, my next point. I mean, we're hearing on an almost daily basis 
uh, how tough things are in farming, and certainly the indications are that it's only going to get tougher. Um, so if I could ask you, Michael, I mean, you've suggested that perhaps the writing might be on the wall for Australian primary industries, the way they operate at the moment. Why is that, and where do you, where, how do we need to change? Where do you think we need to be in 20 years' time for primary industries to be competitive and sustainable and viable? Sure. I'm uh, very pleased to hear that Senator mentioned that uh, Australian farmers need to be focusing on uh, producing and selling high-value products. This is without doubt the key. The, uh, it's commonly uh, phrased, and I heard it only a couple of weeks ago, um, that Australian farmers are the most competitive in the world. Well, I'm afraid that's not true. We, you know, we may be uh, the smartest, the most resilient, but we're not the most competitive. Our cost structures are very, very high. The terms of trade are forever declining. And unless we're prepared to go out into the marketplace and present ourselves, and I think it's also very important that we present ourselves as, uh, as, as one brand. I, I live in Asia, so I see a lot of what's going on. And the New Zealanders for this region certainly sent the benchmark. They speak as one voice. Brand New Zealand is a quality brand. In Australia, uh, I'm forever seeing delegations from Victoria, New South Wales, Tasmania coming up into Indonesia or further on into to North Asia. And the message just gets diluted. And it's a very simple message. Uh, Australia is a very good agricultural producer. We're in this for the long haul. We're part of the neighbourhood. Um, we're not going anywhere. Um, so we need to be getting together, speaking together and representing ourselves better. Just one thing I would like to add is, sure, we need to be in the high value markets now, but I also think we have an incredible opportunity to look at some of the developing markets in the region. We have a lot of consumers on our doorstep in Indonesia, for example, where it's very complex. Uh, I mean, I've been up there for a long time and, and I can't say that I've worked it out, um, but I'm not really that smart. And I'm sure that with some of the collective intelligence that we have in, in agriculture, if we see more involvement on the ground in places like New Zealand, where we really have an opportunity to, to hold the hand of a developing consumer and help guide them along so that they have a better understanding of, of how good our products are, I see this as being one of the great challenges and opportunities that we have to really consolidate Australian agriculture going through to the future. Yeah. Uh, Manny, no, so you've also talked a little bit about this, this idea of, of Australia being able to provide a quality product, and, and Senator, you referred to this as well in your talk, that idea, and you, you sort of said that you want to see us start to focus on, on the quality rather than the quantity, and, and I mean, how do you see us improving the actual product that we are trying to deliver? Where, where would you like us to be in 20 years' time with respect to that? Well, I guess, first of all, if we look at what some of the changes that might occur and almost will occur in the next 20 or 30 years, we'll have population growth. Obviously, the domestic market will be greater. We'll have a much older population. We will have health care costs that will skyrocket. We'll have a greater focus on um, keeping people healthy. People will be keen to do so because it'll be very costly if they're not. At the same time, Whilst now um, 50 is the new 40, as time goes on, 40 will be the new 50. So we'll have a population, I think, that will have a very, very strong focus on health, as well as in Asian economies that are gradually starting to develop a lot of the chronic diseases that, that we have. When we look at why some of these things may have occurred, uh, really our food um, has become uh, something that Obviously, you can make a profit from. But I also think that uh, we have developed a food supply, uh, and I'm not saying Australia particularly, but, but food that is highly value-added, that has very little subs sus substance, I suppose. And when you look at what we eat at the moment, kids as well as adults, about 30 to 40 per cent of what people eat are from those food categories. That is going to have to shift and is starting to shift already. So you see multinationals like Coca-Cola and PepsiCo starting to invest in other companies, in fruit, in other kinds of things. So how do we make a profit then if we're not going to make a profit from products that are just sugar and water that you can get a lot of profit from? What, what can happen? And I guess that is why I think 
value uh, from um, you know, products that have some intrinsic benefit, be that nutrition, be that taste, uh, some benefit to the consumer is important. Um, we heard about farmers being a business. I, um, that's true, but it's not a business that just makes widgets. Uh, it is a business of feeding people and having a connection and understanding consumers, I think, is going to be important as years uh, progress. Um, so I think that um, you know, food uh, both for Australians in the future and foods for the international market, focusing on quality and nutrition as a core component of that quality, I think is critical. Yeah, because you're also interested, I guess, in that notion of, of us being self-sufficient and um, and being able to produce the fundamentals, you know, the, the, the grains, the dairy and those sorts of things. Again, do you think that that's an area that we do need to focus more on to ensure that in, in the future, we are able to support our own population before we start looking further afield. We have a metric called the Nutrition Sufficiency Index that is a metric that gives you a numerical figure for whether or not you, you produce the core foods that you need, which are you know, grain foods, dairy, fruits, vegetables, and protein foods. And Australia has, has a, had, up until more recently, a very, very high Nutrition Sufficiency Index. Uh, and it's starting to go down, uh, and it's starting to go down for a number of different reasons. I do think that looking at the mix of the foods that we produce in our country is important. Uh, it was interesting listening to the talk earlier this afternoon about um, food production and, and uh, uh, what's happening in the north, um, and you know, having farming systems that do produce in, in a region, um, that nutritional sufficiency is something that I guess would be interesting to see so that they don't have to import foods from large distances in order to be sufficient. I mean, that's not to say that trade is unimportant. Of course, it's important. But um, do we want a country where we may be at the whim of uh, international factors that might um, impact on the availability of certain really basic foods, I would argue that probably most consumers don't think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. So just going back to, I guess, that, that idea of, of conditions becoming tougher and there being greater pressure on us to be more sustainable in the long term, I'm wondering, uh, Rick, if you could, you know, what are the things that we need? I mean, Michael has said that we can't keep going the way we're going. And I'm wondering what are the things that need to change? What are the, the, the pinch points in terms of efficiency and in terms of long-term sustainability in agriculture? Well, what we're, the kinds of things we're going to have to do, we've heard lots of talks during the week about intensifying agricultural production. So we're going to have to continue to focus on how to improve our efficiencies in the use of water, energy, and fertilizers in cropping systems. But all over the world, people will be trying to do that. Advanced industrialized agricultural economies, Brazil included, will be pushing for that already. I think one of the key questions we have to ask ourselves is what's our comparative advantage to the people we're going to compete with? And I think it comes back to a lot of, I'll echo the points that other people have made, including Professor Noakes. So what we really need to do is to try to focus in some fashion on, on uh, producing uh, products that are such high quality that it's not the food bowl of Asia that we want to be. The metaphor we want is something like the food health store, where we want to be able to target, you know, the wealthy in Asia that are really looking for um, better nutritional products and so forth and really be able to deliver them. And I think one of the comparative advantages we have over other countries is we have a very strong medical research system in Australia and we should draw on that. I mean, what we want to be able to do is to look at things that aren't just sugar or water, come up with products we're doing a lot of value adding and so forth. Probably, I heard earlier announced from Abares was that there was going to be a 93% growth in the need for vegetables in the upper middle class, not, not just the middle class, but upper middle classes of Asia. That's the sort of thing we could target and doing novel things, things that have high levels of anthocyanins and so forth. But taking it further that, just sort of making ambit claims. Let's link it to medical research so we can actually defend the claims and really target that end of the market. Because if it comes, as uh, Robert Henry said earlier in the week, what we really want to do is be able to sell high-priced food. We want to be able to do it, keep our costs down. But we want to be able to sell high-priced stuff. And I, I guess for me, uh, an example that I'm acutely aware of is SPC Ardmona in the Shepparton region of Victoria. We have an area that's had a 100-year history of great agricultural production, close to um, uh, trade, trade links, water and everything else, and it's being, to some extent, being undercut by uh, imported fruit from China, which can't necessarily make clean grain um, claims. So what's mm -hmm. happening there? You know, the, 
clearly it's not just going to be about increasing our production in areas in the north, but we have to really be able to focus on how to get people to pay what our costs of production are, and that clearly must be we have to offer them something they can't get anywhere else. Mm. So let's look, let's figure out what our comparative advantages are. Yeah. Actually, Tanya, because ANZ did a report feeding the, the dragon, which I guess was looking at the, the market opportunities present in China. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what that report was, what questions you were trying to answer with that, and where do you think that's going? Yeah. The, um, Part of the report was definitely looking at the mega trends that are going on within China. So understanding the change in consum consumer behaviour and what that means for agricultural farming businesses here in Australia in terms of opportunity. So um, it's not just the way in which food is you know, acquired or sold, if you like, in terms of that supply chain, but it's also in terms of how it's distributed. So I think the point on the rising affluent um, it absolutely is a factor in that. So people are more prepared to spend, you know, more in terms of rather than um, the mix of their diet being more skewed to grains, it's actually more protein based. But it's also the way in which um, where they're buying their product from. So um, at the moment in uh, China, the predominant market for fruit, vegetables and um, meat is for purchasing is in wet markets. Mm. Um, so the estimate in over the next 10 years, for example, in most, um, if I'll go proteins, is that's going to halve in terms of where you buy um, protein and it's going to actually shift to being in what you would call um, in, in uh, re organised retail. So that's either supermarkets or, or mega hypermarkets they're mm. called mm. so that context around how you market how you brand how you package your product to be on a shelf rather than a commoditized product in in a in a wet market is actually becoming becoming you know far more important and then understanding what is going to differentiate you and and what is going to equate to why that premium would be prepared to be paid mm. so i think to your point um, before this isn't about um, the whole market in China, you know, 27 provinces is equivalent to, you know, each province is a country in our language. So being able to capture that part of the market or, you know, actually a really small share of it is actually still, you know, extremely significant. Mm -hmm. So being able to understand that and then also the distribution, distribution channel side. So, um, and I know it's, it's surprising, I think, I suppose, for us, but outside China's metro areas, the cold chain distribution is still actually relatively unreliable. It's only 15% that is actually being distributed that way, whereas in a developed market, it's, it's more like 90%. Yeah. So for the Tasmanians or, you know, or the South Australians or the Western Australians who've got aquaculture, you know, being able to get those products inland, because refrigeration obviously is quite key and it's perishable, becomes actually something that they can you know, work towards and consider. And there's many other factors, you know, customs and other like in terms of how you get your product into the market. But what we're talking about for Australia still is we're never going to own that market, if you like, because it's still, you know, where what we produce is still a very small amount in comparison to what their consumption is. Mm -hmm. So the ability to better understand that and no different to Australia, we need to understand our consumer when you're marketing a product. Mm. Um, that becomes more and more relevant, whether you're at the farm gate and want to go to f further down the chain, or even if you're a processor and understanding where your product's going to go. Mm. It's interesting because it's often, you often hear people say we are the food bowl of Asia, and you've uh, talked about this in your talk, uh, Senator, that, that really we're not, and certainly I've heard that sentiment echoed by a number of people on the panel. So I'm just wondering, how, how have we got to this point of thinking that we are, and if we're not, what are we? Well, um, that's a good question. I think it's largely people in my profession trying to make it sound like there's a huge opportunity there, um, or bigger one than there really is, but, or we've got the capacity to, to, um, to meet. But the reality is that we are going to be a, I think, a smart player in the market, but it's going to be, as we've heard, it's, it's, it's a lim we've got a limited capacity. So the discussion about knowing our market, understanding our market, having well-developed supply chains is really, really important. 
It's interesting that you talk about aquaculture. The aquaculture industry in Tasmania at the moment is withdrawing from the international market because its local market is growing at a huge rate, 40 per cent last year, 30 per cent the year before, 26 before that. So it goes to the discussion that I had about a national aquaculture plan and, and the importance of seafood in, in the diet and your discussion around a, a healthy food source. Um, so we need to actually understand our markets really well. Um, we need to innovate. The discussion around SPC, I chaired a food processing inquiry that reported in 2012 and we visited SPC and as we walked around and not long after I went in, I turned to the manager and said, you've got a lot of money to spend here, haven't you? And he just looked at me and nodded the head. Because <coughs> canned fruit is a declining market in every market in the world except for China and India. Now, they're going to struggle to compete into that market, but new ways of packaging, new innovations that, have, that we need to bring through are the sorts of things that are going to sustain a business like that. Now, they're going to have to spend a, a, a lot of money. Uh, huge opportunity. Talk to some of the farmers up there. They're, they're seriously smart farmers. They say to me, the dollar gets to 80 cents, they can't grow enough fruit. So you've got all of those fluctuations that work along with it. Uh, and some of them saw what happened coming and were preparing for it, but got caught because it happened a little bit sooner. Some people were very happy that their market, if you like, was the cannery. Yeah. They didn't understand what was happening in the real market, which is at the supermarket shelves, where because we can buy fruit and vegetables every day of the week and expect to be able to, we don't buy canned fruit or processed fruit and veg so much anymore. So those changing trends in our markets, I think, are really important for our vegetable industry to un or our industries to understand. And talking to a vegetable grower yesterday, it was really pleasing to hear him say to me, we produce 25% more veg in Australia than the market currently needs. Um, we wonder why the supermarkets are getting a good price out of us. We're oversupplying the market. And that's why I say that those new market opportunities that we need to help negotiate um, for our industries are so important because that's the opportunity to put some price tension back into the market and get some better returns for uh, back to farm gate. And it's the market that's going to do that. We can make all the promises that we like as politicians, but we need to get the settings and the frameworks right for the, for the industry to be able to do it. Tanya? Um, without being controversial, I think I don't like underplaying that what the opportunity is. Like, and we did a report um, the year before last called Total Greener Pastures and what that opportunity looks at to 2050. For the agricultural market in Australia today, like if we can get to capitalising on what opportunities actually are available, it's worth, you know, in the order of $1.7 trillion, you know, in addition for agriculture. Like, you know, it, we, let's not call it a uh, food bowl, let's call it something else, but that's an incredible opportunity for us to be able to, and we'll make a, a significant difference and would continue to make agriculture a core industry, um, you know, for Australia and to our economy. But probably the second thing is what a fantastic situation to have more choice, you know, as a, as a supplier. So, if domestic consumption, you know, does increase for aquaculture, then you know, then as a, a producer, then you or a, a fisherman, you've got a choice about where that product yeah. goes to. So, like I think about it as a banker, I'm not making the decisions for our customers, but we've got to give them choices so that they have, you know, are better informed about where, you know, or how they run their businesses. And I think it's the same. You know, if that does create tension at the consumer level and for politicians and for the whole market around what, you know, domestically you have to pro pay, yeah, I think that will feed into, you know, the debate. But it means that perhaps the, at the farm gate there, there actually is a bit more influence around, you know, price making rather than just having a price take. I don't think that's controversial. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I could just, we, we might, um, there are, this is actually an opportunity to ask questions. We're going to take some questions at the end as well. Um, but bearing in mind that we've been talking for a while, if anyone does have any questions, there are fixed microphones up and down the stairs. So I'll keep an eye on them. So if anyone does have a burning question, please make your way to the microphone, um, tap on it if you can't get my attention. Um, but there'll also be an opportunity at the end. So I'm going to change topic a little bit to things we've sort of been talking about outside our own borders as well. Um, 
and we live in a super connected world and geography and national borders are really no longer the obstacles that they were to, um, to engagement. And Catherine, you have a particular interest, I guess, in how we can and perhaps should be interacting with our near neighbours, but also our further neighbours in terms of helping them, but also them helping us. I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one of the biggest uh, things that we can work on in agriculture is building relationships. And building relationships is a three-part process as far as I'm concerned. So we need to build relationships within agriculture. So, you know, we, we've got the sort of top 10% of farmers that are doing super, super well and there's a whole heap of research done. You know, you can argue whether or not it's, we've had enough funding or not, but the research is being done and it's somehow not filtering through. So we need to figure out how we can, whether or not it's the use of language, the conduits with which we're getting that information across, what, is, what are the blocks that are stopping agricultural farm sharing like and, and getting everybody so getting you know you've got your innovators and your early adopters well how can you get more early adopters being innovators how can you get more late adopters being early adopters so how can you sort of flow follow that relationship through um, to ensure that we're sort of we're increasing agricultural production the second um, relationship that I see we need to form is with our consumers I think maintaining a social licence. We've heard a lot about regulation and um, weather and markets and all that sort of stuff. I'm no expert on that, but I can certainly talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think one of the biggest things that we can do is really change the language and change the way with which we're engaging for our consumers. We've got a rise in activists taking down and trying to really pull apart what we do in agriculture. And I think it's really important that as farmers we step up and share our stories. But we don't just step up and share our stories, we step up and share our stories in a way that is engaging and new to people who aren't lucky enough to have agriculture as their career. So if we're able to do that, we're going to go a long way in building trust. I've heard so many times, yeah, but Catherine, they need to support us, we grow their food. Well, in Australia, we sit here with a full gut and a wet throat. Food is actually not a need in our country, it's a want. Uh, sorry, not a want. Uh, not, you know what I mean. <laughs> Work with me here. <laughs> um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, it's, you know, it's quite almost verges on the, the side of arrogance to say that we're more important than someone who builds the bridges that help us get our produce to market. We need all of those things. Mm. And the third aspect is building relationships internationally. I see agriculture as a global community. Um, we've seen and learnt lots this, over the last couple of days about food distribution and production um, capacity in different areas and you know, the misalignment with um, getting that food out to certain markets. And something that I think is really important is that we build relationships, and Nuffield is just a perfect example of this, is knowledge sharing across countries um, from a farmer to farmer basis, on a farmer to farmer basis. So I'm really chuffed to be involved with the Department of Agriculture um, and Influential Women have just recently formed um, where we're going to be looking at building an a Indonesian Australian Women in Agriculture Alliance, where Australian and Indonesian farming women will get together and actually mentor and share ideas and share knowledge. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that is one of the most effective ways that we can build relationships with Indonesia. Uh, food production is a very, very important part of Indonesia. So if we can actually um, show that we are really passionate about helping them on the ground, A, we're going to get real difference made, but B, we're going to be um, working and building those relationships. So um, then the Indonesian women, like I'll take the Australian farming women over to Indonesia, I'll then bring the Indonesian farming women back, which is going to bring cultural diversity and a depth of experience that I don't think you can buy. So yeah. those are the three levels I think well, are important. You brought up three interesting ones. They're actually was something that I wanted to ask um, Rick about. I mean, you've talk, obviously you've got interest in, in technology and moving things from the laboratory to the field, and Catherine sort of talked about that idea of early adopters. How are we doing with that, and could we do better? And Yes. Where does that need to improve? I, th I think we could do a lot better. Um, it, a good model, I, I, you can probably tell from my accent, I worked in the U.S. and actually for about 18 years in the land grant system in the U.S. So there's a really seamless model between, that involves universities, federal government, industry, and so forth. And people who are often trained as students, you, you, you go see what happens at farm days and so forth. And these guys that have been farming 20 years or so, they're going back and talking to their former professors. There's this link, this bond that just continues indefinitely that we don't have in Australia. We need to see if there's a way we can create that sort of uh, facsimile at least. But, but more broadly, if you look at literature on how um, uh, innovations diffuse in farming communities, there's a lot of good work at University of New England more than 20 years ago that showed 
you know, for only 5% adoption from newspapers, but you have broad reach. One of the most effective ways for technology to be transferred is when somebody looks across the fence at what their neighbor's doing. And, and I, with, um, with apologies to anybody who might be here in Oz, Aid, and ACR, I think something that we really have not taken on board enough is to try to involve the private sector in foreign aid. And we've got people who are doing farming activities in lots of countries. And if we could work with them, we're, and their, their reach is probably at least 10 times more than our agent, aid agency, maybe 10 times more than all the world's aid agencies. If we work more directly with, with international companies that are doing agriculture around the world to make sure they were using state-of-the-art technologies, I think you'll see a, a much more rapid spread you know, to try to address farming needs around the world because you know, poor African farmers will look across the fence at what somebody's doing and they'll pick it up. It's one of the most efficient ways to get things to operate. So I think it's something we should be looking at is how we can better engage with the private sector to help diffusion of technology around the world. Why should we care? I mean, most analyses show that uh, water is going to be an increasing challenge around the world. There's not going to be enough water to go around for the needs of cities, mining, and agriculture. Um, you know, great threats occur from people not getting enough to eat. You know, all the uh, political upheavals in North Africa were first driven in the last couple of years, were first driven by um, crises over bread prices and the like. So it's really important for us to try to make sure that even if these places aren't markets for us, that we do our bit um, mm -hmm. to help generate better agricultural productivity. And I think we need to engage more with the private sector to do it. Sure. Now, Catherine's raised Indonesia, so I have sort of obviously have to refer to you, Michael. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you like can comment on. Things here. Can we yes. go back? <laughs> All right, I'll just, I'll just yeah. take a seat. Yeah. But would you like to comment on turn our interaction? Turn your microphones <laughs> off and sit back, relax for a minute. Perhaps you can uh, share some thoughts. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Look, I'll jump straight into the uh, uh, relationship side of things. I think that's probably the most important thing that's been discussed in the last little while. And uh, I think that um, uh, on the subject of relationships. I would like to play in the role of government in what we do in the, in the marketplace because I think we expect too much of government to develop relationships. And if we look at what's happening, particularly in Indonesia at the moment, and we can, I mean, anybody uh, who follows the news or is from the region will understand the relationship's not great. And one of the reasons why I would suggest that it is is because a lot of our diplomats, commissioners and so on who go into these marketplaces they're only there for a short period of time. It's a two-year posting, um, and then they're off somewhere else. And I think developing cross-cultural relationships in, in, in a complex environment like Indonesia, where Indonesia has a, an amazing cultural history, uh, 300 different ethnic groups, 700 languages across 17,000 islands. Um, it's been a democracy for 16 years. Um, you know, there's just uh, there's, there's a whole range of issues. And I think that agriculture has a very unique opportunity to, to be involved. In agriculture, 10 years is a, is a short-term horizon. If we're looking at doing something, um, we're looking at at least 10 years. And to develop a relationship cross-culturally, we need to be taking a, a, a longer position. One of the things that I've found, uh, and, and again, referring back to Nuffield, you put a bunch of farmers together, and, and Nuffield is fantastic. We share rooms, we, you know, we sit down at the table, and you know, we, we, we just get along. Farmers know how to get along. Um, and in my, my experience in, in Indonesia, and I've worked a bit with the Northern Territory uh, Cattlemen's Association in, in helping to develop an exchange program for students coming into Australia. And the thing that I've said to uh, the Cattlemen's Association is, just as cattlemen, talk to cattlemen. And then you've got this great commonality of just sit around and talk about cows. You can do that for actually quite a long time. So it's the same thing with, with, with farmers. And I think what we, what we tend to do is if we keep the, the brackets tight in our initial communications, we're going to get along. When it starts getting broader, then we, we struggle. And we, we experience this just this week uh, amongst our farming groups. So. When you're dealing cross-culturally across a broad range of complex issues, the bands are pretty wide. So don't expect to achieve too much too quickly. Again, I go back to what our expectations are of government. And I think business has a, has a very important role to play. And again, playing back in with aid and, and ACR and AusAid, look, we've spent billions of dollars uh, on aid up in countries like Indonesia. And we really need to look at what benefit 
either Indonesia has got or that, that we as a, as a nation have got. I know mm. it's a big debate. You can't put a value on, on aid. You shouldn't put a value on aid. But uh, I can tell you that uh, from my experience, if we're not, we're probably the only country in the region who's not doing it. Mm. Yeah. I will come to you, Senator Kopik, in a minute, but we do actually have a question on the floor which I'd like to take. If you could state your name and affiliation, please, and who your question is directed at. Um, Michael Lyons, Nuffield Scholar from North Queensland. Um, my question, I guess, is to anyone on the panel, but I'm wondering if we've got a case, a bad case of affluenza in the West, where actually our affluence is causing us more problems. We as farmers keep hearing about the need to increase productivity and increase productivity, yet as a country we waste up to 50% of the food that is produced. I guess my question is, do you see that there could be a system develop into the future where production maybe is maintained, but prices back to the farmers improve, we can produce value, reduce waste, and with that extra income actually use that on farms to develop real sustainability for our natural resources, our economics and our families? Well, that's an easy one. Who would like to take that? <laughs> I think there's a basic assumption you can make there that if we don't waste as much of what you produce, we won't buy as much, so the prices will go down. It would seem to me you're asking the consumer to pay more to consume less is not a really um, good uh, market proposition. Be big pun? Demand yeah, but increase. not not here. Not, oh, well, it, well, gradually here, but most of the demand increasing talks about about uh, China, pretty much, isn't it? Mm. I, I'd just like to make a comment. I, I, look, I I do agree. Um, you know, we hear that um, the population of the world is increasing, and therefore we need to double the amount of food produced. But there is an enormous amount of food that's wasted. I mean, I was watching a program the other night about orange production and. General was saying, you know, 70 per cent of the crop just falls on the ground and, you know, they don't use it. So there's much to be, as population increases and as domestic demand increases and as consumers become more, I guess, culturally aware of um, environmental issues and the need to reduce waste is perhaps one of the most simple, the simplest non-debatable aspects of uh, sustainability. Um, I think that it, 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 it's, a, it's an important proposition. Uh, I can see that for su that supermarkets and retailers, having consumers wasting less may not be a particularly um, tremendous um, proposition, but uh, I, look, I think that it's going to happen anyway. And if food increases in price, as it may do, then that may also trigger less wastage as well. Oh, sorry? Yeah. It might be important to keep in perspective. There's a real dichotomy between Western industrialized countries and developing countries in terms of food waste and food loss. So in, de in developed countries, you often get claims of 40% <coughs> food wastage, maybe a couple hundred kilograms per person a year. But in developing countries, it's pretty clear um, from research that's been done by Swedish authorities and so forth, it's less than 10 kilograms. I mean, it's a very small amount. It actually gets wasted in developing countries. And even there, it's things that are perishable that are mostly lost. Uh, loss. They have a far greater problem with um, losses during storage. So it's a reverse of what you get in Western countries, but it's not wastage. And, and one of the key things we need to keep doing in developing countries is help them develop better ways of protecting their grain uh, and so forth from, from loss of pests and diseases. Mm. Morning, Senator, did you? Oh, sorry. Quick yeah. mm. get the mic on, please. Tanya, sorry. Um, your study on China, did that look at if China addresses its its infrastructure issues with the green highways and food wastage getting and getting it into their markets, what that'll do their capacity to compete with us in horticulture? Um, the it did look at it in the sense that it I think it's since 2010 or 2011 they've been proactively working on the refrigeration side of being able to get more and more um, cold storage. Um, distribution and it absolutely connects to which products and obviously coming from which countries can actually go into those markets. The production side at the moment to keep up with their own consumption, you know, which if you look at bar graphs in our language you would have gone, you know, they're actually doing pretty well in, in most products other than say perhaps soybeans. But the reality is, you know, that really small difference in the bar chart is actually, you know, 
possibly five times of what Australia produces. So the connection to still how that can create real opportunity. And we've got to also keep in mind for, you know, not all farmers want to play into that part of the supply chain. So it's actually working through individual businesses and understanding how that fits for them, you know, locally as well. And it kind of goes back to the choices piece. But I think your point is absolutely right. If I kind of change it a little bit in the sense that where does the, um, you know, so if you use mutton or beef, understanding, you know, if you can use every single part of the beast, and, but then actually understanding how do you break down the carcass and package it because, you know, in terms of how it gets cut up and, and then actually distributed, actually feeds as well into what packaging looks like, you know, how you refrigerate it, how you store it, and then how you deliver it. Because if it's going into the markets, they can be in, you know, bigger pieces because then that's cut down locally somewhere else versus the value add that we could be doing, you know, onshore. And different, and or that actually another stage of a local business may be to set up processing in another country. So I think it creates lots of permutations and combinations that creates opportunity but it depends on also what the appetite of the individual business owner has. Yeah, yeah. So again, cutting back to the, the Indonesia question, if I could sort of kind of jump to, jump to a question, I was wondering if you have any comments in terms of our relationship and our agricultural relationship, perhaps not just with Indonesia, but further afield, Senator? Well, I think Indonesia is going to be one of those markets that becomes very important for Australia as a, com a country. There's 200 million people there, just to the north. Um, they are becoming... Um, a very sophisticated community. You look at the way that they're accessing their food in the more developed areas in the cities, they're a supermarket culture or a hypermarket culture. They're, they're already in that place. Uh, I've uh, spoken to um, growers who are looking to access that market, have been accessing it for a long time. So uh, at this point in time, it's probably specific commodities that are going in there in particular markets. But I think that relationship will grow and change. The relationship stuff is really important, and, and it's one of the fundamentals of any of our business. And talk to anyone who's done business in any country in Asia. It's about the relationship first and the trust that gets built out of that process that then leads on to further opportunity. And even uh, at a local level, a lot of what we do is about our farming relationships. And so the role for government in that context, which you were talking about a, min a minute ago, is a facilitation role, in my view. I mean, ministers come and go. Um, parliament, um, uh, councillors in embassies come and go. Uh, and and, and the consistent farmers tend to hang around a bit longer, as you say. I think that's right. And so those relationships that get, get developed by the private sector, by business and industry, are the ones that will end up carrying it. Uh, the, the way that we conduct ourselves obviously has a lot of influence on, on that and that's been clearly demonstrated by events over the last couple of years um, and before that that a lot of us didn't even know about until recently. So I mean all of those things are important inputs to the relationship uh, but, I, but I think you're right. We play a, a very strong facilitation role in establishing the relationship uh, and then having industry and business working alongside us to continue that relationship and make sure it's maintained is, is going to be absolutely vital. And it doesn't matter what market you're going to, uh, that's what it's going to be about from my perspective. Yeah. We've actually got another question over here, if you <coughs> better step up. Could we get... Hello? Oh. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Wayne Dredge. I'm a 2014 Nuffields uh, Scholar from Australia, uh, commercial fishing sector. Uh, my question is for the Honourable Senator. Uh, Sorry, Richard Colbeck. Um, I'm hearing a lot from the panel about technological innovations and improvements in industry and efficiencies and how we're going to drive all this into the future. One subject that has come up continually this week, over and over again, is the lack of young people coming into primary production. If we're going to continue to exist and maintain our competitive edge internationally, which is producing a high-end, high-value product, both for ourselves and Asia into the future, don't we need our best and brightest minds working on the farms, on the boats, maintaining that and attracting more into the industry? How can we do that when current social trends, and I hate to use your own words, Senator, see leaving the farm or leaving the boat as escaping? Look, I, th I actually think we're starting to see that turn around. Um, if you look at two years ago, I think it was, 
there was a situation where University of New South Wales didn't have enough great people applying to fill a, the agriculture course. That's starting to change, and I, th I, I think it will uh, continue to. It, it, it's about what people can get out of the industry. People want to be able to make a decent return, and while farmers continue to talk about not making a return, um, people in the community is going to say, well, that's not something for me. And so almost our own worst enemy to a certain extent. It's been going on for a long time. Uh, but um, with the emergence of new markets, with the growth in demand, uh, and, and with a growing understanding through some of the relationships that we've been talking about, I think, I, I think that's starting to change. Um, I hope what I'm seeing has a longer term trend, but I think that's actually starting to change. Uh, and if I look at what's happening in the aquaculture industry in Tasmania, for example, the number of young people that I see wanting to get into that industry, the number of high schools that are setting up um, vocational training programs for kids to get into aquaculture, uh, it's really very, very strong. So it's about where people see opportunity. Uh, and, and so those things need to be demonstrated as part of the story of agriculture. Uh, and so in aquaculture, that's certainly happening at, in, in, my I'm back. Um, in, in my home state in Tasmania. And I think uh, those opportunities will appear through other sectors as well across the agricultural economy. Neil, would you like to comment? Sorry, much well, Incidentally, um, Rudick's just released a report that we've done on the state of the young farming population in Australia. And it might surprise you to know that we're actually doing pretty well. Um, we tend to look back at the past as our reference and there were, if you go back 30 years, there were twice as many, three times as many farms depending where you go. So that just reduces the number of young people with, you know, just proportionally by a massive amount. What's really important probably is the proportion of young people in farming and compared to our competitors, and I, I, we chased statistics from as many other countries as we could find, I managed to find it for 27 other mainly developed countries. Most less developed countries don't have good statistical collections. The only one of those countries that was doing better than us in terms of the proportion of young people in farming was New Zealand. Um, and you know, New Zealand dominated by the dairy industry um, and minister, our agriculture minister's comment about their front desk, their single desk sort of situation, um, it's sort of daring is a younger person's game anyway. So I think that could almost explain the difference between us and New Zealand. So, you know, for example, in looking at 2006 data, uh, about 13% of Australia's people who called themselves farmers on the census were under 35. In the United States, it was down about 5%. Canada, it was 7 United Kingdom, which is sort of average for Europe was about 3%. Essentially, agriculture is gentrifying around the world and we are, to a large degree, resisting the trend. And the, one, the, the most important message in this is that young people seem to be interested in farming as, as the senator says, the farm offers a future. And that's a farm probably that's large. And so if we want to maintain a younger profile of farm managers, the farm sector needs to keep adjusting so that we have those large farms to provide that future. But that means there are going to be fewer young people and other people in rural areas because of it. It's, it's almost, that's the way the system works. I'm not saying it's good, but that's the choice we have. Yeah. Rick, did you want to comment? Yeah, I really want to thank the questioner for getting us back on the, on the subject, because one of the things that we clearly need to address in the future is maintain really skilled human resources in order to be able to do this. The Productivity Commission for years has pointed out how Australia had 2% annual increase in productivity, fantastic, led a lot in most Australian industry, but it's slipping. And it was mentioned, Julian Alston's name was mentioned yesterday in one of the talks, having pointed out about 10 years ago that, with, that you could already start to see a decline in Australia's productivity with a um, gradual reduction in funding for research. And it won't be just about research. I mean, if we are going to stay at the cutting edge of technology and be able to make the kinds of efficiencies in production that we're going to have to have in order to keep our costs of production down, we really need to have people who are really skilled, skilled in these things. And, and yet the statistics show that the number of tertiary graduates in agriculture lags far behind uh, most other industries. So you know, tertiary education is the only thing, but it's one benchmark that we're not getting to the level of training sophistication that we need to have 
to really be able to keep up with the technology and apply it on the land. Yeah. Catherine, did you want to comment? Yeah, I think um, something that uh, rings really true to me is I think we've got to be optimistic about our own industry. I'm not saying that we need to be positive. I hate that thing. You've got to be positive. Well, positive is fake because sometimes things are really tough. But I think we all really need to have an optimistic outlook and, and really share that. that that helps not only um, people looking to come into the industry. I don't know about you, but I don't want to work in an industry that's constantly whinging about drought, fire, flood, politician, and what... Oh, pardon me. <laughs> Politics. <laughs> um, I'm famous for having absolute flops on stage, but anyway. Um, so it, does, it, it doesn't look good externally, but the other thing is when we're fa facing really tough times, like the Queensland drought and whatnot, you have no idea of the impact of constant negative comments on your neighbour. And I think if we can start to be optimistic, to remember why it is that we're in agriculture and start to celebrate that. We have no control over the mainstream media, but we have a beautiful tool in social media. And most people that are our consumers in the cities that, as I said before, don't have a necessarily a direct relationship with agriculture, they're all on it. So we can start to engage. Don't just get on social media and preach. Get on social media and engage because it's with that engagement we're going to let people in on the amazing industry that we do have. Things are tough, absolutely, granted, sometimes. But things are also sensational sometimes. Mm -hmm. So we've got to maintain optimism. My observation is there's in, in hard times, not everyone's doing it difficult. There are people who are doing well. But I think they feel socially constrained from actually making comments about that when others are suffering. And that lead, I think that, what you're saying, that isn't good for the image of the industry long term, but I don't know the solution to that. Mm. Just one more comment, then we'll cut to a question. comment about the issue of um, people going into food production and farming, and that is that uh, most people, and, and you know, perhaps tertiary training is too late. I mean, most kids really have got no idea where food comes from or how it's produced or what it is like in the 21st century, and I'm not sure that I even know what that is. Um, so I guess uh, I'm saying, is there a potential role for introducing some aspects of this in the same way that I think nutrition is important into the school curriculum at a very young age so that kids have a connection with it? Yeah, and you talked about education as well. We've got a question from the floor. I am Dr. Jalal Arif from University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, Pakistan a member of the delegation of Pakistan Agriculture Coalition. Uh, while availing the opportunities of the presence of best mind, best heart, and best experienced panelist, I would like to ask question that post-harvest losses and the climate change and the challenges of the quality food production is a major challenge. How we can redesign our agriculture policies to address these issues with special reference to global food security. Mm. I again repeat that the post-harvest losses and the climate change, how we can run the agriculture mm. in the scenario of climate change and the production of the quality food, the residues, the MRL issues in the underdeveloped countries. So how we can redesign our agriculture policies to run this agriculture with reference to the global food security? Who would like to, Rick, would you uh, like to comment? Well, when it comes to adaptation and climate change or just climate variability, I mean, it, it, most every strategy I've been able to think of about this always involves water in some way. So everything we can do to improve the efficiency of management of water will be a key thing, and it, it's true around the world. So the more we can help people in some countries that aren't using minimum or no tillage at present to do more of that, um, that, that I think that's going to be one of the greatest, you know, most serious challenges. And even in Australia, probably one of, a friend of mine, David Bauer, observed some years ago that probably the, in the climate change debate, the whole argument is about carbon tax and so forth. We lost sight of the fact that although we probably should be doing our fair share about it, the fact is most of what, whatever is going to be driven by the climate is not going to be our doing, but we're going to have to adapt to it. So we have to make sure that in debating um, climate change um, that we don't lose sight of the fact that one of, the key, one of our key priorities ought to be focusing more attention on how we're going to adapt. And you think about it, the kinds of things we have to adapt are things that we've had to try to do over the last 100 years to address, address climate variability anyhow. There are no regret strategies, we call them, about how do you manage um, change. Cities are going to be a big part of this too. We shouldn't just focus on agriculture, but increasing the greenery 
of cities by using water more efficiently to reduce the heat signature of cities. Um, and among other things, help reduce the mortality rates of senior citizens in heat waves are the kinds of things we really need to be working on. Now, we're actually approaching the end of our allotted time. I'm just wondering if there are any other questions from the floor. If anyone does have a question and someone's running to the microphone, so that's always a good sign. Oh, are we going to have fisticuffs? Maybe? Well, no? Gentlemen, <laughs> be nice. <laughs> um, I'll, make a, I'll make a comment. Okay, fire away. Okay. Um, just to pour a bit of cold water on some of the stuff on this high value stuff, um, or to get your wisdom, uh, I live and operate and run an agricultural business in probably one of the most volatile environments in the world. My production can change by a factor of 30. What advice do you have on how I go out without increasing in order of magnitude my risk profile by going and chasing fickle customers who may well leave me when I need them most and when I have no production? Catherine, anyone? Who would like to tackle that one? Senator? Yeah. yeah. Hospital pass. One of the things that you're going to have to do is to work with your industry. Some of the markets that we're talking about are not an individual farmer type supply situation and I think we need to actually understand that. I came back from China a couple of years ago talking about niche markets and people looked at me all funny. Um, because they saw niche market as farmer's market or something like that. And, and so the language that we use here versus the language we're talking about in some of these market concepts are completely different. And uh, we've, we've had a conversation earlier about relationships uh, and we do talk amongst each other and we look over the fence and see what our neighbour's doing and see if that works and if it works we copy it. But working together in accessing these markets we don't actually do all that well. In fact. Um, it's, it's like trying to develop policy at some times. It's, working with farmers can be like keeping frogs in a wheelbarrow uh, because they just all head off in different directions just when you think you've got them all sorted out and working together. But working together is going to be an absolutely vital element in meeting these markets. You're not going to do that individually, so you need to find somebody potentially that's providing a similar product to yours and using their capacity to help balance out your product and meet those markets. That's the way that I would see it working. Uh, and so that there is going to have to be cooperation across the agricultural sector in meeting uh, these extraordinary markets. So we went to a small regional city in China, uh, in the southwest, called Kunming. Seven million people. Um, you know, that, that's, that's a market. That's Sydney and Melbourne. I mean, if you're supplying, think about supplying or having access on a relatively um, individual capacity into, the, into, into those two markets. I mean, that, that, that's the sort of thing that we're talking about. And of course, there is a whole heap of work to be done on the supply chain, but can I tell you, they actually understand the quality and the value of our product. I had an intern do some work for me. 83% of that upper middle class are prepared to pay a higher price for a premium quality product. I spoke to one young mum over there who was buying Bellamy's baby food, which is an organic baby food manufactured in Tasmania for her baby because she knew it was safe. Now that's in a small provincial city in the southwest of China. So they actually do un our, our, our quality, our food safety, which is probably our premium asset at the moment, the, the safety of our food and it is an absolute huge asset for us in those markets, is well understood. But you need to work together to actually meet those markets, otherwise that variability that you have on your property um, is going to keep you out uh, and, and you're not going to meet the market anyway. So um, find a way to work with others in your industry to actually make, make that happen because otherwise you'll find it very, very difficult, I think. Michael? Yeah, I'd just like to, um, this is, might be a little bit off subject for the question, but while we're on the subject of uh, markets, um, just two points that I'd like to make. I, I mentioned before, we expect too much from government in some areas. Well, one area where I think we do need assistance is in these markets, uh, in Indonesia, for example, and other parts of Asia, where labelling laws don't really exist. So we, uh, we incur a cost to produce a premium product to put in the market. We're competing alongside products that are incorrectly labelled. And I think there, there is a role for government to be involved in, in helping to develop uh, better labelling laws to, to make sure that we do get the premium we deserve. 
The other point that I'd like to make, I, I've been building around wet markets for 20 odd years. Now, if you look at uh, what we know as a wet market in Asia, it's actually the equivalent of a farmer's market here in Australia. Now, we all know that um, if you're selling food, uh, that the highest premium you will get is when you have a relationship with the consumer, i.e. The, the farmer's market. We're seeing this rapid change through Asia of uh, the, the transition from the supermarket, I'm sorry, the transition from the, the traditional market to the, the supermarket, and uh, on a convenience basis, fantastic. I just also think that we need to be looking at some of these traditional markets that exist in, in Asia and saying, and I know for a fact this is happening in Jakarta, the govern, uh, current governor, Joko Wi is saying, hang on, these markets have been in the same place for 200 years. What we actually need to do is to improve the, the hygiene, the, the sewerage, the water, the cleanliness, um, and provide a place for farmers to be selling their product. And I think in, uh, from Australia's point of view, this provides an enormous opportunity for the marketing of premium products. We, we tend to think in, in Australia of farmers markets as being premium, and traditional markets as being low, low value markets. And I think we need to change that paradigm. Sure. We've just got time for one quick question. Uh, Stephen Watkins, UK Nuffield Chairman. Mine's not really a question. It's to point out that the previous questioner was also a Nuffield Scholar. But more to the point, we want to end on a positive note. So if you're looking for a topic, then go onto the Nuffield website and dial in any subject you like, from honeybees to rural stress, any sort of topic like that. And there's 50 reports every year go on that website. And if you link through the different countries, you can actually follow these scholars on their journeys. What can be better and what can be more interesting than that? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, I think that is actually an appropriate note to end on. So if you could please join me in thanking our esteemed panellists who've delivered some excellent insights this afternoon. Um, I'm not going to name all of them because you know who they are and because my brain won't get through it. But uh, if you could please join me in thanking them all for attending today. Thank you.